Okay, hi everyone. Um, it's really stressful to talk about Brian Anthony, an Emmy Award winning uh, sensing expert, so I'm a bit under pressure, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, my name is uh, Chara Kanzaman. I am the director of MIT Virtual Experience Design Lab at the School of Architecture. Um, and today I will try to explain some of the concepts that we're interested in and how we are using technology to bring forward uh, concepts related to metaverse. But um, when I first invited to talk about metaverse, my first reaction was, and I did this before for IOP too, what is metaverse? This is the one question that everyone asks, including myself. And the problem, my problem with that concept is very ambiguous and it really doesn't make sense if you don't really wrap my, your mind around a lot of concepts. And I, I discussed this with my wife. She said, is it the, the thing that Mark Zuckerberg does, social media thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, social VR and immersing yourself in you know, imaginary world, lying and talking. These are cool, but is this what we are really talking about? And is it the one thing that is interesting? I think not. Because for some other people, it's about digital twins and productivity and uh, getting things faster. It's about education. It's about training. And somehow, it's also about blockchains and Web3. It's a lot of things. If you're lost, you're not alone. Uh, because there are so many concepts and ideas crammed into one single word. Um, and here's one thing that I want to take note of. I think metaverse is not a thing. And there will no, there will be not ever, no metaverse or multiple metaverses because it's not a thing. That's a problem with the concept. Just like artificial intelligence, it's an umbrella term that describes a lot of things. Um, AI is a field that studies software that can predict things, that can learn from data, and many other things. And we call it AI. You cannot point to AI. This is AI. And metaverse is just like that. It's a field of study that combines many topics. And one of them is immersive media, augmented reality, virtual reality. All the things that we are now hearing about, the tools and devices, are somehow in this field now. And spatial sensing. I think uh, Brian Anton already talked a lot about spatial sensing. And it's, I think, one of the fundamental components of this new field. Another one is real-time 3D, the ability to collect and transmit large amounts of data from one point to another, digitizing uh, physical spaces and vice versa. It's about learning and collaboration. Again, you heard a lot about learning and collaboration because one of the big potentials of immersive media and metaverse is it creates new opportunities for learning and collaboration. And of course, human-computer interaction in new and un unpredicted ways, and many more. But I want to call it spatial computing. It's much easier to think about. It's much easier to understand what is it good for, how can we improve it, how can we move forward with it. So remaining of the talk, I will try to talk about spatial computing instead. And if you have questions about metaverse, I'm happy to try to answer. But again, I am lost, so maybe you shouldn't. So the first topic is immersive media. Uh, in my lab, we are interested in developing uh, immersive media experiences that changes how people perceive, how they learn, how they interact with each other. There are a lot of open questions about it. The technology is moving so fast, but the design and experience side is actually lagging behind. So we are trying to understand what immersive media does to us, how it does it enable us. And I think one important aspect and one sort of major uh, point about immersive media is it's a platform to tell stories in space. You can storyfy any, co any topic, put it into place, and people will understand it. But immersive media also is not a new thing. I just want to show you a little thing. It's the only, I think it's the only thing from the past that I want to show. This is 1966. Ivan Sutherland, not far from here, invented first head-mounted display around 60 years ago. And this device is a mixed reality device. It could show 3D images in space, overlaid in the real uh, physical space. Uh, and you can see his invention, all the details. And practically, we are using the same technology, just improved and better and faster. <clears throat> but 
you can understand it's another thing. Our dreams about metaverse has been there for more than 60 years, maybe 100 years. But what we do is we open up a new area of studying architecture, namely to study um, architectural spaces and um, it's going sorry architectural spaces and architectural history in a new way. Uh, immersive media allow us to represent a lot of things in interesting ways. So this is one of the early examples we did. It's a story of a pogrom that happened in Istanbul. Uh, in 1950s, and what we did is we created this experience that put people in the center of the events that were unfolding in front of them. So the idea is that can you put a person near the victim and see what they actually experience? Can we convert some hard topics about hate and discrimination into things that are much easier to grasp and understand? So this, uh, this film, around seven minutes, allowed people to explore uh, outdoor and indoor environments around the space, which in a fictional photography studio, you were observing people coming by, and go, coming by and going and talking about their everyday life, getting their pictures taken, and you were the photographer, supposedly. And then things got harsh, and you end up in this um, horrific place we sort of stop where the thing actually gets nasty. So uh, there are a lot of things goes into making these type of experiences. Uh, 3D scanning, digitization, 3D modeling, animation, recording real actors in space and blending all in together using game engines like Unreal Engine or Unity. Um, and it takes a lot of skills. And our, one of our goals is can we start training design students and other students to gain some of these skills so they can start making these type of experiences themselves. So we started teaching um, in this topic uh, since then, and we have been looking in that different topic every semester. For example, this one is in a Palestinian village of Lifta. There's a contested territory. There's an ancient town. So a MIT student visited there, digitized the place, and started telling stories within that digitized fictional space. Um, and just like that, um, I can tell I'm coming from an inter interdisciplinary background, both design and computing, and we are trying to understand the human spatial experience in creating these type of uh, experiences so that we can start begin thinking about machine intelligence in the same sense, because in the end, sharing space with intelligent agents, we will have a completely different experience if we can start intuitively talking to uh, machines and AI. So, there's all this new field about spatial AI that is very interesting, and I'm going to talk about it at the end of uh, my talk. But teaching has been very instrumental for us to sort of start trying to understand how we can move forward with this new uh, area of study. And then most of the things we do sort of falls into the, the area of spatial sensing and reconstruction. Um, it is an important topic because uh, there are a lot of tools required to digitize physical spaces, it's computationally intensive, and there are different methods that has been in try. So we are, I'm gonna show a few examples how we use spatial sensing and reconstruction uh, for making of this type of things, for example. Uh, two of my students, Adriana Georges and Lauren Gibanes, uh, has been traveling around the US collecting photographic evidence of the oldest houses in the country. They're trying to understand the topic of longevity what gets preserved, what gets demolished. And they created an atlas composed of very high fidelity digital representations of these houses. So meanwhile, they're preserving these places in digital space. They also start sort of critically approaching to the idea of building uh, and deconstruction. And uh, roughly the process takes uh, as follows. You take a lot of pictures using handheld cameras or drones and using this collection of images, you use a photogrammetry software that identifies how each image is related to each other, converts them into 3D point cloud, and then eventually a mesh, uh, representing anything that can be captured with a phone in 3D. Uh, and then there are a lot of still, there's still a lot of problems to cleaning up and then trying to accurately represent something. And we are also now trying to develop our own methodologies to how to get accurate representations uh, uh, using photogrammetry. 
Another project uh, we are currently working on is called Latent Archive. Um, our goal here is to use similar techniques to extract spatial information from historical uh, archives, like documentaries, fiction films, newsreels, which depict a lot of places and spaces that are gone. And we might be interested in capturing this information from very noisy uh, data. I'm going to show, for example, like uh, this one. This is the first uh, footage of Istanbul in 1897. You can see it's beautiful, but it's very noisy. Computers usually are not good at creating spatial representations out of this type of things. So the question is, can we use techniques that improve this type of images and reconstruct them in 3D space? Um, so one thing we do is we clean up images, denoise them, upscale them, color them, so we get the highest quality possible images, and then use photogrammetry again to uh, reconstruct this. For example, this is a partial reconstruction of a film depicted in Le Mortel. Um, we mask out people and moving objects, so we clean up as much as possible to create this type of representation, so that now you can zoom in and go around this room and start looking at the space in a different way. Uh, and a film scholar can basically put the uh, put the film in space and start looking into individual frames in a traditional way to better understand how this film was made. Uh, and again, the Istanbul's image upscaled, colored, and then here how we sort of uh, digitize it. So it's the same film, this time in 3D. You can put a VR headset and immerse into this space. Um, given how noisy the image, I think uh, the way we, we could recover a lot of spatial information was impressive, especially this little ferry here you're going to see. Now you can go measure, look at, compare this 3D material with other things. They are no longer images in the screen, they are 3D objects that you can interact with. Uh, another one. Walls of Istanbul. You can tell I work in Istanbul a lot. Walls of Istanbul captured in a long footage, converted into um, a real 3D model of the Istanbul walls. Now we can just go back in this 1960s Istanbul, look at how all the, the situation was then, start measuring things again using 3D models and representations. Another method we use is computer vision. This is an emerging field. This is ongoing, but uh, if you don't have uh, enough evidence for creating 3D models, you can try using computer vision to create representations in space and then do some of the things we have done. Uh, this time, not as uh, high fidelity, but here is one of the early footage from Manhattan. Uh, using only computer vision, we are just reconstructing the scenery, and then now we are able to go around the buildings and look at the city in a different way. Here we can also do it in films. And now we are trying to find ways to stabilize these types of predictions so that 3D film looks much more smooth and uh, uh, you know, uh, better in space. So the third point, real-time 3D. We have immersive media and we have tools to digitize. But one thing that is interesting is the ability to use this information in real time, especially if you're training in the context of training, collaboration, things that takes place in real time and space. You need technologies to transmit and compact things and transmit to other places. With the 5G technologies, now it will be more possible to do this type of things. And few companies are already working on uh, developing platforms for this. And one of my students created a very beautiful project that involved 3D real-time uh, transmission. Nikolos uh, works on a monastery in Greece. Uh, it's secluded, and it's on, open to mail. Uh, no woman is allowed. It's an ancient place. It's very inaccessible. His goal is to first reconstruct and recover this uh, ancient building and also try to understand something interesting. Can we actually look at the spirituality that, that people are uh, sensing there? And can we recreate in virtual environments? Is physical space, or in other words, is virtual space is, is real as physical space? So what he does is, again, use photogrammetry, go around the building, and create a very high fidelity representation of the building, and develop an XR uh, system. 
and also do some GSR sensing to measure the emotional reaction of the people while they're visiting these virtual places. Um, and here's quickly uh, how it looked. So this is the actual uh, actual building. Nikos went there, flew, flew a drone inside and outside the monastery, and then created something. Yeah, something interesting to look at. So now this person is looking into the virtual representation of the monastery. I think I'm also missing sound, but that's okay. And going through the same experience with the monks, actually a recording of a prayer is installed there, so the person is actually getting this sound and the ambience of that prayer at the, real, at, at the same time. But what Nick does, he teleports himself inside this place from another area. He uses my working situation is not optimal. What are we going to see? Um, okay. Let me just describe it. Maybe we can see it later. So he uses four depth cameras, reconstructs his body in space, gets a point cloud representation, and places himself in the VR while the other person is going through this digital space. Basically, wherever you are in the world, using a special sensing equipment, you can immerse into another place and interact with people in space. You don't use any VR or anything. Uh, it's completely uh, using spatial sensing technologies. And we don't have real time here right now, so unfortunately. And then what he discovered is actually all that high quality virtual experience was quite compatible with the physical one. He, put these GSR sensors on monks, and they went through the same experience, both in physical and then digital, and the measurement of how, how their emotional state was, was similar. He tells them that it basically tells they had the same high-end emotions in both places. So this does something about the utility of immersive media. Um, so training on collaboration is Again, Brian talked a lot about it, uh, but I think it's one of the f important areas uh, to look into, and we have been working on this for a while now, and want to show you the latest thing that we have done with a student of mine. You know, the piano learning is very hard. I'm trying myself. Without an instructor showing you how to do it, it's impossible, because it's not about pressing the right key in the right time, or pl placing even your hand in the right position. It's about movement, it's about gestures, it's about posture. These things are not easy to, to do using an app or a technology that doesn't involve a real person. So what we try is creating an experience that shows the expert playing the piano in front of you while you are trying. So I think you know where this is. This is Immersion Lab. Uh, and Brian also explained what these markers are. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the result. Maybe I can show you the input, too. I hope my internet works, because I have videos I need to show. <sighs> OK. That's not. I was told that the Wi-Fi was acting up today. Is there a way to solve this problem? Ah. So what we do is we invite a lot of expert piano players into Immersion Lab, record a couple of uh, sequences, both 
this type of scale studies, but also you know, prelude or something from Mozart or Bach. And then we look at how they move and try to understand different gestures that involve in different expressive modes and impressive modes. And then we put, now we are working with novices, put them into the same place. They try to do the same things. And our idea is that seeing the motion in space and the gestures and the postures is going to greatly improve how they learn a skill like piano playing. And this is, of course, applicable to any practical skill that is hard to learn without an expert's guidance. And we have been also looking into intelligent design collaboration, not learning a skill, but maybe two experts or two agents trying to solve a problem together in space. Um, and we developed this concept called Mediate. What if we didn't design any interface uh, for these people to do anything but use only speech and talk about the space and the system just takes care of the rest of it? So the idea is that we use both natural language understanding and computer vision to match what a person is saying to what is presented in the screen so that we can create these intelligent notes so that they just can go around and talk about what they think. And the result becomes uh, sort of these uh, spatial markers that are automatically generated that allows people to communicate asynchronously uh, over a design. Can you give me some feedback about the furniture of this room? Now, the first person left this question, and the other person is now talking about uh, the same thing. I don't love this chair. So this is a different way of approaching interactivity and collaboration. I think a special natural language understanding and computer vision will enable these tools, uh, and we will have more capacity to interact quickly and intuitively. Because one of the challenges in VR and AR is you are presented with a lot of digital tools and controllers. They're not easy to use, and I don't see people are comfortably feeling that they can go and be productive in these spaces. So one of the challenges is actually going uh, beyond this uh, challenge. So these four things is mostly what we already sort of started to understand, but I want to talk something about something else. So immersive media is also can be framed usefully as the augmented mind. And there is a, a particular reason why I believe this is the case. Um, I want to talk about Henry's brain. Do you know patient HM? Have you ever heard Henry Molaisio? This is one of the famous cases in the history of psychology. Henry was a young person uh, in 1950s when he had a very severe epilepsy that he couldn't get, get, away with, um, get on with his life. And finally, his doctor decided to remove some portion of his brain. Uh, this was something that was done these days. And what they removed is these two little pieces in his brain uh, called hippocampus. Um, and he was cured. He no longer had epilepsy. Uh, but Henry also <laughs> lost some other things. He no longer was able to form a new memory at all. For him, the time was frozen. He didn't understand the time was passing and his, was li his life was going on for the next 60 or so years until he was dead, he was dead around uh, 2012. So for 60 years, Henry didn't know that he was aging. He didn't know there were a lot of presidents passed. He didn't have any idea. This was a curious case, but it allowed psychologists and cognitive scientists to discover a lot of things about the brain. And one thing is the hippocampus was the place where our episodic memories were encoded and stored in our brains. We thought that we are not able to create anything about uh, our past. Another interesting thing in the same place, this hippocampus is a very fas fascinating area in the brain. Uh, in mice, they do these studies. Um, this is what you see is a mice uh, going around a little box, and there is a single electrode in a single cell in his brain, a, a cell that is called play cell. It, is, it has a very interesting behavior. It is only activated in a very particular location of a space. The cell is selecting an area in the physical space and only gets activated in that area. This play cell 
happens to be in the hippocampus too. So there is this interesting relationship between how we understand space and how we remember. It appears that human memory is itself spatial. With immersive media, we are creating this immersive place, capturing the perception, adding multisensory experience and spatial understanding and memory, allowing our brains to work in a different way. The potential here in the immersive media that it taps into our brain in a different way and it can op optimally talk to us. It can help us learn better. It can help us remember better. It can help us become better problem solvers better decision makers. It's almost like this little magical device goes in directly into your brain so that it becomes an efficient uh, device yourself as a machine. So talking to our brains through immersive media is an exciting area. People are interested in using this for uh, mental health uh, solutions, for therapy, uh, treating Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease, and all sorts of things that involves a cognitive phenomenon that can be addressed with uh, stimuli presented in virtual reality. And now we are also started to look into how can we use this technology to create modeling AI uh, agents modeled after our own uh, spatial skills. So this is one of the first metaverses seven years ago. Uh, we were, what we were doing is putting people in this unbounded virtual spaces, collecting uh, their data, how they move, where they look at, and try to understand how they solve a large human scale maze. So this person, the subject is uh, running around. In reality, this is what they see. They try to go from the blue pill to the red pill. And eventually they do. It's a long recording. They look around, try to find their way, and finally they end up somewhere here in the red pill. So using immersive media to collect experiential data to understand human behavior is already growing. And there are direct application of this in uh, industry. Uh, people are using this for creating training uh, platforms to understand what people are paying attention to. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, what people are paying attention to, what is the optimal way to present a stimuli to a person, so that they can start creating uh, spatial purpose education a platform for individuals. And then this leads us to the real problem. Can we make AI spatially aware? I think this is sort of the holy grail of AI and immersive media intersection. Because once we are able to understand how human intelligence works in space using immersive media, we can start creating AI agents that can intuitively interact with us. They can understand the space just like us. They can tell where they are. They can tell distances, the space of a room, not just measurements, but an understanding of space. So we modeled uh, this type of understanding on a simulated agent. Um, what we did is we created some of the cells that I mentioned, like place cells. In addition to that, there are other cells, like grid cells and boundary cells that work in different ways. So we created this neural network that tries to represent space in a biologically plausible way. So this little robot can navigate inside these mazes, just like the human did. And here's uh, how it looked. Over a course of um, training, the robot was able to avoid boundaries. Whenever it comes nearby a boundary, it stopped, turned around, and tried to find a new way. It's doing a free exploration. But it essentially learned that it shouldn't go through boundaries. It connected its vision to this representation. And what the, the curious thing is, when we look at how these cells were activated, these are um, boundary cells that we modeled, and they only sort of fire in a north, south, west, or eastbound places. And you can see northbound 
uh, cell, this red means higher activation, gets higher activation here, while southbound gets higher activation here, westbound and eastbound. So while learning, while understanding navigation, this agent was able to represent something internally, something that is useful. For example, if you asked the robot, where are you? It could tell I'm somewhere in north or somewhere in south because this information is now get encoded in its internal uh, representations. Another thing we did is, instead of getting this type of biological representations, what if we use human language and stories to try a machine to understand verbal instructions about space? So this is part of the PhD thesis I was working on. But the idea that once we are able to understand this type of things like north, south, west, or up, down, left, right, far, close, a lot of concepts that we actually understand space with, robots are actually capable of following very complex interactions. Here's, this is Genesis Story Understanding System. It's a system that actually represents stories uh, in, a, in a symbolic way. And on the right, there's my vision system that talks to this story understanding system. And the task is, given the set of instructions, can this robot replace the cell phone battery inside? So you're gonna see on the left the thinking of the robot, and on the right, its uh, actions. Each time what the robot does is refer to the computer vision and ask a question to that. For example, is there a blockage over the phone? <laughs> or is uh, the dead battery inside the phone or it not? So each time it gets a result and generates an action to take the next step. And if there's something wrong, it goes back and tries to solve the problem again. And finally, this is a relatively simple problem, uh, but it's impossible to solve without giving spatial rules. Here, there is no spatial rules. There's only plain human language and a robot with a vision system that can understand uh, language. So language understanding, again, is very important in these type of cases where we are interacting with these agents uh, and we want them to be responsible for their actions. So the next steps, I believe, for metaverse are three folds. I think in the next decade, we will see more implementations of human intelligence augmentation because spatial computing will help us be better at memory, better at decision making, and better at problem solving. Integrated into training systems, we will have more uh, solutions that address specific problems um, for any educational or learning uh, activity. Explainable AI is currently an important area. When we have effective communication with uh, simulated agents, we will have more reach uh, into productivity. And finally, real-time physical and digital integration. Although I show this, I couldn't show, maybe I should go back and show. Um, Real-time 3D, it's not there yet. We are doing these experiments, but there's still problems with both how to package data and how to transmit it, especially given the bandwidth of the current networks. It's really com uh, uh, complicated. But once we have that, I think there will be better integration of manual and digital processes for better knowledge transfer. Um, I can answer a few questions uh, if you... Uh, should I take from the screen? Okay. Of course, is there a metaverse application around training factory workers working in specialized industries like medical device manufacturing? Uh, currently, I don't think there is a, a to-go solution for this type of specialized activities. And the reason is just I explained. Making of these solutions are very expensive and hard, but requires a lot of skills. Um, but people are working on this type of thing, and we are actually looking into the very fundamental problem of how they really teach something. So we are at the level to understanding the development of user interfaces and systems to make learning a better experience in uh, virtual spaces. The headsets give me a headache. What hardware advances might make AR more palatable for a wide audience? Um, there are a few reasons for this. Uh, 
the, the first and foremost reason is the, the technology currently used, the, the LCD displays and LED displays with the, the lenses beaming a lot of light is not really comfortable. And also, I think the ergonomics of devices are currently not there yet. So with better design of headsets, I mean, Meta just released a new headset I didn't try yet. I think they're going to send it in a couple of weeks. They say they have a better uh, weight management of the device, so it doesn't really cumbersome. But uh, they also invented a new lens they call pancake lenses that reduces the distance between the screen to the eye and use less light, I guess. So I think over time, there will be more comfortable solutions to this. The metaverse and everything concerning spatial computing is starting to be explored by threat actors. As a company, how can we self-regulate this space to ensure the safety and security of the company and staff? Yeah, the first part, the metaverse part, I mean, I don't think in the near future we will have an open-ended 3D world that everyone interacts with each other. I think it's it's a dream for, it's not going to come for a couple of decades. Uh, but other than that, I don't think we, let me just think through it. Self-regulation is not different than any web application you have currently. Uh, I don't think there is more threat to a person that would come from spatial interaction than interacting in a, a 2D screen. I don't think there is much difference. <laughs> what calling the umbrella research field metaverse confuse people with metas metaverse? <laughs> yeah, but I think that's not on us, it's on meta. Uh, they call themselves meta after they heard the term metaverse, they didn't make it up. Um, <clears throat> but I think calling digital virtual worlds metaverses is misleading. We had these open worlds for 30 years now, the sex, starting with Second Life. There were these places that you could interact with other people, talk to them, chat, even do transactions. So there's nothing new there. And calling these places metaverse is just a marketing term, in my opinion. So yes, it's confusing, and I think it's intentional. In a world of full of mis disinformation, what discussions are taking place about how augmented reality could be weaponized by malign actors to change societal behavior? I think it's a great question, especially given what I just said about human mind. Um, <clears throat> I have no answer to this, uh, but um, again, this is concerning the regulation of a technology that is sort of yet to come. I think we should start addressing problems when they appear, but Again, there might be a threat, yes, I don't know. Okay, um, I think the most important aspect of immersive experience is the interaction, which many of, peop of the examples you talked about lacked. A headset can only provide you visual and audio. Any thoughts? Yes, I have thoughts on that. Um, interaction, just like overstimulation, can mean lack of experience sometimes, uh, because from my point of view, immersing in a digital environment and moving within it is a form of interaction in itself. We are already interacting by virtue of presenting ourselves to this place. So perception is an active process. It's actually very tiring. So one of the critical things to consider when you design these experiences, you, should, you need to make sure that you are not overwhelming people with these sensory stimuli. And again, immersive perception is already tiring, so adding on top of that a lot of complex interactions, if they are not necessary, you should avoid that. This is my principle in interaction in general. If you don't have to do it, you shouldn't do it. That will leave people more space to really explore what's going around them in their virtual space and really be immersed in it. The, actually, this type of interactions takes away from the experience, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, no. Uh, it is metaverse a combination of these two worlds, words, meta, physical, and universe. Uh, I think it means beyond universe, not physical, but beyond. 
It's sort of meaning the beyond our realm metaverse. Um, but I, I, if my, I might be wrong. My Latin is not great, but I think it doesn't mean physical. Um, could VR be used in education as a better and faster way to teach children? Yes. Not only faster, but also more engaging. I think one of the things that is exciting about this is the storification and gamification is in a different level in virtual reality. And for children that are especially uh, neurodivergent, that are not learning things the way uh, other people do, presenting things in space is a fascinating opportunity. There are actually uh, solutions for, uh, for kids in autism spectrum to interact with content much, effect, much more effectively. Uh, so yes, I think this is also in the realm of uh, addressing cognitive uh, aspects of our uh, interaction with the VR. Um, okay. They talk about VR having the same effect on mental health as psychedelic therapies. Why is this? <laughs> um, I don't know much about psychedelic therapies. So, <laughs> um, but again, I'm repeating maybe myself, but VR has a different way of talking to our brains. And this is, uh, I'm not making this up. Perception operates in a very fascinating, spatial way. Looking at a screen is not equivalent at being in a VR world. Your brain interprets that sense, sensor input completely different way. Actually, one of the exper experiments we did with the first film I showed you about Istanbul, we go back and ask people about their experience a year after they visited, I mean, they showed the film. First thing they did, they talked about the film as a place. They were thinking, I was there, there means that virtual space, and they were able to accurately draw the layout of the space they were in, put the objects where they were in a very, very accurate way. They remembered. Just think that when you think your own home, this is the thing that you always correctly remember, own house, you can go there mentally, go around, look at things, change your point of view. This is our skill, cognitive uh, spatial cognition uh, allows us to mentally go through the spaces. And virtual places, just like physical ones, are stored on our brains as places, places we visited. So it's really different uh, in the sense that how brain consumes this information. That's why I think it's uh, also an opportunity for tapping into that and trying to understand, can we reduce stress? Can we improve productivity? Can we make our better decision makers? Everything about our cognitive skills I think we'll be empowered by using tools in immersive media. And I think this is a great question to end. My time is over. Um, there is a great experience. I don't think you no longer are able to do it. It's called Tree. It's a film about a tree, and you Im embody a tree. Meanwhile, someone burns something in front of you while you're watching the fire in the forest. It was very powerful, I can just say that. So yes, smelling is interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I hope you had a great inspiration and insights on the future of digital technology and uh, digital transformation. This concludes our 2022 Digital Technology and Strategy Conference. Uh, we hope to see you all again in the near future in another our ILP event. Please also join our R&D conference next month. Thank you and have a great day.